Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of John, chapter 14. Today I'm reading verses 1 through 14 out of the NRSV translation. This is very shortly after the Last Supper. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me also, so you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture reading does take place very shortly after the Last Supper. Uh, it's part of the it's in a part of the gospel that the theologians call the farewell discourse, as Jesus prepares his disciples for a time when he will not be with them. He knows his time is almost at an end. The soldiers and the temple guards are already making ready to arrest him. This discourse, this this um. Farewell discourse is what pastors call theologically rich. There is a lot of different themes and sermon ideas that come from these last teachings of Jesus. We could probably spend the whole six months on just this small section of scripture. As we listen to the words in today's readings and throughout the entire farewell discourse, remember that they've been translated from the original language of Aramaic into Greek. And then from Greek into English, I mean, and Greek and finally into English. And what you're going to notice is even through the translations, you can still hear and feel the love that Jesus has for his disciples. And you can feel his concern for them. These final teachings are just for them, his followers. And because of that, by extension, they're also for the entire church. His primary concern at this point is not what's about to happen to him, but what's going to happen to his disciples after he is gone. It's not difficult to see that today's scripture reading, which is in the early part of the farewell discourse, is an attempt to soften the blow to the disciples who, who are still not realizing that Jesus must be sacrificed. They're not aware. You could actually make the argument this is, that this is the first major crisis in church history. As his disciples are going to have to figure out how to carry on faithfully in a dangerous and uncaring environment without Jesus there with them. Jesus gives us three assurances in today's readings. The first of these is in the verses 1 and 2 where he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If, I, if it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Instead of the word house, 
Several of the other English translations use the word dwelling places. And I think we all know that the King James Version uses the word mansions. The Greek to which these words come from literally means to abide, to abide together. It means to have a close relationship like that between Jesus and God. And the beauty of this promise is that Christ's death is not going to end the relationship with his disciples, but instead it's going to fulfill the promise of those relationships. He goes to prepare a place for his faithful, and he will return to bring him back with him. You know, that's very much like the image of a traditional Jewish marriage of that time period. The groom, after the betrothal, would go and leave and build a home and prepare a place for he and for his bride to start the beginning of their life together. Then he would return, they would marry, and he would carry his bride to begin their new life. Similarly, Jesus is promising to share eternity with all of those who believe in him. He is going to prepare a place. The book of Revelation actually uses the same in, uh, imagery as all of the faithful are referred to as the brides of Christ. He is going to prepare a place, a place for his followers, for those that believe in him. The next promise comes as Thomas questions Jesus. Jesus had said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, but you may be where I am. You know the way to the place that I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? A reasonable question, I think. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So the second promise in this is this little discourse here is that we have a sure and a clear way to know God. Remember, if you look at the first chapter as John lays out his gospel, very early he says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. So Jesus has made the way for us to know God, for those who believe in him, who believe and who follow his teachings. And the third promise in this section is the one that I've always found kind of surprising. Jesus tells them, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. I can remember as a young person reading that and thinking, how in the world can anybody else cure the sick, give sight to the blind, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead? And he says, we are going to be able to do things greater than he did. And I always just kind of went, I didn't get it. And on one level, true, we simply can't. We don't have that healing power from God. We can't give sight to the blind, cleanse the leopard, or any of those other things. But in another way, we do have power that he didn't think about. It. Most everyone in this room right now has within your arm reach one of these little cell phone things. You can pick that phone up and punch a few numbers in it, and you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world, either with voice or even with a, with a video chat. That's something that would not have been imaginable 
in the first century. My phone at the moment is sitting back here making a recording for YouTube, which we'll upload later today. And anyone who wishes can see this service either later today or next week or next month or next year. Again, the thought of taking a photograph or having a series of photographs together in a moving picture, as in a film, is something that could not have possibly been imagined in the first century. A young appliance repairman living here in Denmark who loves the Lord and is musically gifted can go to an audition to be part of a television show. And he can sing songs of faith that millions of people can watch simultaneously all around the world at the same time. Again, that's not a first century concept. And I wish Warren Pay hey, good luck tonight on American Idol. Congratulations on making it to the final eight. And our prayers go with you, Warren, if you happen to see this. In this same section, the scripture says, Jesus opens it with, very truly I tell you. That word you, translated from Greek, is actually plural. So that means that the promise is to all who believe in Jesus and who pray in his name. And you know, sometimes I fear that we get so used to saying a prayer and then closing it with the words, in Jesus' name I, or we pray, that we might lose sight of what that actually means. <coughs> Fred Craddock shared a warning that I want to share with you today. He says, this is not simply a formula for closing a prayer. To use Jesus' name as authorization for one's petition to God implies that those who do so know Christ, abide in Christ, and make their request from the relationship rather than making selfish requests imported from another value system. To pray in Christ's name means, amongst other things, to be thoughtful about one's prayers and to even pray about what to pray for. I think the late Reverend Craddock makes a very good point there. Sometimes I do fear that I and we pray on autopilot, asking for the same thing over and over by the road, not really thinking about the words that we're saying, not thinking about the awesomeness of who we pray for, to, and the privilege of having that channel of communication open directly to God. As I think about our busy schedules, our fast-paced lives in this modern world, I'm reminded that St. Augustine once said, God became man that man might become like God. And then a little later he said, God wants to give us something, but he cannot because our hands are full. There's nowhere for him to place it. Sometimes we need to slow down, to listen to God's call in our life, to hear his spirit lead us. C.S. Lewis once said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciousness, and shouts to us in our pain. Friends, let's never forget the promises that have been made to us or the price that was paid to fulfill those promises. Let us never take for granted the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior made on our behalf. He has prepared a place for us. He has set a path whereby we can know God. And he has empowered each and every one of us here with unique gifts and talents to do great things in his name. And so now, my friends, I invite you to join with him at his table this morning. Holy Communion.